Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the, the Science Cafe for 2022, sponsored by the Ohio University Research Division and the uh, local chapter of Sigma Xi, uh, the Science Honor Society. Uh, my name is Howard Duwall. I currently serve as the Vice President of Sigma Xi. I'm a faculty member in the Department of, of Chemistry and, and, and Biochemistry. Uh, today's presentation uh, will be uploading to a YouTube video. So if you want to see something again, um, it should be ready in about 24 hours. It will be captioned, and you can, and you can go to the website. Um, in terms of uh, the, the room and the layout, if there's any further assistance that you might need or access, um, um, please come down and, and talk with Roxanne here, and she, she'll help you. Uh, if you've been to a cafe before, you know that the intent is for them to be interactive and lively. So we strongly encourage you to ask questions during the presentation. If you're in the audience, raise your hand and we'll bring one of the microphones to you. Uh, if you're online, please type your question in the chat uh, for those that, that are listening. Um, the science cafes are being held once a month this year. Uh, the next one will be Wednesday, October 5 at 5 o'clock in this room um, by Dr. Viorel Popescu from the Department of Biological Sciences. And he'll be talking on the secret lives of the hashtag real bobcats of Ohio. Um, today, uh, we're very happy to welcome Professor Nate uh, Shefchek of the Department of Biomedical Sciences in the Heritage College of Osteopathic Medicine. And as you see, his topic is Worms in Space, Improving Astronaut Muscle Health. Professor. Oh, thank you. I'm all done then. <laughs> um, so as you can see from the introductory slide, I think one of the great things about studying worms in space is that we can say worms in space and we can be like pigs in space, which is actually where they ripped it off from originally for the, the first folks who actually did worms in space. And I'll show you one of their original logos as we go on. But for some reason, since he started flying worms, they've got television programs with worms in space and they've got video games of worms in space, and they've even got Slimy the Worm going to the moon, um, which is all quite different from actually doing science, but it, it at least captures the imagination. And of course, if you're like me, you just go, worms? What do they have to do with people? Who even knew that worms had muscle? All right, in terms of why, um, this is always a really, really difficult thing, and I think trying to explain this in different terms can be quite difficult depending upon the audience. So probably most of you in this room have grown up in America and so you've been drinking the NASA Kool-Aid for all of your lives about why space flight is amazing and why it's great and how we've got all these spin-out technologies that make your life easier whereas I'm a little bit jaded and I go there's not that much spin-out technology coming out of the space program. That's the heyday of the 60s. Nowadays, you know, it's all your smartphones and we're sending those up to the station. Um, so trying to rethink that, particularly if you think about some of the, the need from the American public who finances most of research to really appreciate why you do it. Um, I was really struck by the fact that the National Cancer Institute was really facing a backlash because their kind of marketing logo since the 80s has been, we're going to cure cancer. And then it gets to be, you know, 2010. And everybody's like, well, you know, we've poured hundreds of millions of dollars into the cancer research fund. Why are you still saying you're going to cure cancer? We've given you lots of money. And so I think thinking about that, I feel like you kind of need to rebrand things a bit. And so in my time in Europe, we've tried to push things in that direction. And so NASA still, I think, is stuck in many ways in the 60s with the way they approach it. Whereas if we look to other countries, they have different views. So originally, the Russians kind of posed the idea that really the planet's only here for so long. Now, I know you and I have limited lifespans, and the planet will still be here when we die. But 
you know, from a humanity perspective, eventually the planet will go away. And so we need to have solutions for the species, for survival. And so the idea of actually colonizing other planets holds a lot of appeal in that regard. On the other hand, you know, much like America, other people in the world want to make money. And so, you know, going to other places that have other minerals and other elements is potentially a source of income. Um, and so there is a common goal of habitation or colonization or deep space exploration, sometimes for exploration's sake, but other times for financial incentives. Now that all sounds great, but going and living somewhere else where there's no food and there's no water and there's no air, that, that's a bit of a problem. Um, and so there are health problems associated with this, and this is why we need to kind of study these sorts of things in order to make um, these longer term goals possible. So one of the things that we know about space flight is it induces biological change. And one of the other things we know about biological change is that we basically see it in anything that's flown in space. And this is where I go, well, hmm, are we finding things changing in space because people want to fly things in space and therefore they have to find something in order to do another experiment in space? Or are we finding things changing because they actually are changing? And I think sometimes when we think about science, we don't think about the idea that sometimes there are alternative reasons that people arrive at the conclusions that they do, which are not strictly based upon things being real. Sometimes we just want to believe the results are real. But I think the idea that things change across species is pretty compelling evidence that things do change in space. And particularly if we focus on astronauts, as NASA likes to do, we can come up with little charts that kind of tell us what sorts of changes we see in different biological systems, so physiologic systems. And basically every three months, NASA updates their risk register for various things to try and reflect the current state of what we get. So fortunately for me, I study muscle. And again, fortunately for me, astronauts have changes in muscle in response to spaceflight. So it becomes something that I can potentially take my skills and start to study. Now recently, there's been a little bit of a change in things with, with things here in the US. So about 20 years ago, NASA didn't, or lost or chose to lose the capability to launch things into space. And so they've reprioritized how they've spent their money. And so as a result, there's basically a generation of scientists studying things in space that hasn't really existed. So over the past few years, as launch capabilities have come up again, we've got a younger generation of scientists who are very interested in studying things in space. And they're particularly interested in studying rodents, because that's where NASA's invested their money. And in doing this, They've kind of tried to think about changing the paradigm from how people think about spaceflight research, where once upon a time, say in the 60s, it was, ooh, space, it's interesting. People float around. Things change. It, oh, it must be microgravity that's causing all the problems. Or the other kind of contingent that's out there, Oh, well, you know, once you get into space, you don't have protection from radiation like you do here on Earth. Therefore, it must be radiation that's causing all the changes that we see. But when we think about the radiation element, one of the things you have to remember is we know radiation's a problem. So therefore, we actually put radiation shielding in our spacecraft so we don't irradiate our astronauts. So it's not super surprising that a lot of the biological changes that we see in space are not due to radiation. But you're going to hear a lot of that coming up again as Artemis goes to the moon and people start talking about the impacts of deep space on biological systems. So if we start to reimagine things, we can actually think about what are the actual kind of components of space flight. So we've got the microgravity. We've got the radiation. But really, from an operational perspective, it tends to be distance from Earth that we think about. So for example, Let's say somebody happens to go into ventricular tachycardia, as, as happens, um, and we don't have a defibrillator on the space station. Hmm, need to get them back to Earth in order to actually do something for them. So 
On the space station, that's not necessarily a big deal, particularly with Soyuz, you could potentially be back within eight hours or faster, depending upon your descent trajectory. But as we start to think about going further out, that becomes more of a problem. And so we think about going to Mars, 15 minute lag, just in communications. There can be some communication lags, even with just going to the moon. But really what's kind of more interesting are these two little elements of basically confinement. So if we think about, well, particularly if you're used to being at a university, being confined to a dorm room, it's not necessarily always the healthiest place, is it? You know, you're eating and maybe not cleaning and maybe some bacteria are growing, but it's okay, you know, you'll build your immune system by having these things there. So really being on the space station is a bit like that, right? I mean, it's kind of disgusting if you think about it. Here's the toilet, there's the table for having dinner, and there's the gym, you know, where all the sweat's coming off. So there are some elements of being in a confined environment that can influence health, which are not always things that you immediately think about because it's not as exciting as thinking about floating around in space. It's a bit more like saying, ooh, it's like you're a college student and living in a really bad dorm and your mom didn't teach you how to clean up. Um, and again, you know, it's not surprising people don't like to clean. It's no different on the space station. But the other thing that we don't necessarily think about is that it's also a confined environment. So it's not necessarily just hostile in terms of being closed and not just bacteria, but also potentially having certain gas compositions. It's also just small, right? So if you think about it, if you go, oh, wow, you know, there's these muscle changes in space flight. Wow, you know, three days in space, 7% loss of muscle. Oh, there's something crazy about space flight. And then you go down to Kennedy Space Center and you go, oh, there's a mercury capsule. Oh, I'm going to go have a sit in it. You sat there like this and you're like, hmm, this isn't very comfortable. Hmm, maybe I'm stuck in this thing for three days. Maybe the reason I'm losing muscle mass and I'm not feeling very good is because it's like I'm stuck on a Greyhound bus driving from New York to San Francisco and I can't really get up and move around. And so you can think about things actually being a little bit different than maybe you imagine if you start to think about things as just being floating around and getting a radiation. But if you actually take a holistic view of what goes on in space, and so if we break these different elements down, we can think about studying them on Earth in different ways. So with radiation, aside from kind of historical data from big radiation events, it really is a question of looking at people who are undergoing radiotherapy. And then we can break things down in different categories as well. And then the other thing that they've basically decided is much like, say, with hallmarks of aging, they've decided there are hallmarks of space flight. So whether or not this is actually true or just represents the opinions of the individuals who wrote the paper who maybe have very specific areas that they'd like to see funded and there's an N of one example from one astronaut showing all of the data that this thing is true versus some other things where it seems to be true across species. I think take it with a grain of salt, but as we're thinking about science, having a framework for actually testing hypotheses is useful. So at the moment, the idea is that we have mitochondrial dysregulation, we've got DNA damage, we've got epigenetic changes, we've got changes in telomeres. And so these are the sorts of things that people are kind of pushing as being areas to study. Now, in addition to studying things in people, we can use model systems. So the current ones that are really used for space flight or have been used for space flight are rodents. So historically, this has included rats and mice, but now is pretty much just mice because that's all they have habitats for. Again, historically, it's included fish like zebrafish. The fish tank's been decommissioned, so that's unfortunate. But one of the nice things about the fish tank was the astronauts loved washing the fish. It was good for spiritual health. Um, not so good necessarily if you're trying to do an experiment and the astronaut's sitting there tapping on the on the tank, you know, trying to play with the fish while you're trying to have it not be exposed to those things. Um, fruit flies, worms, which is what I work on, bacteria, and plants. So these are all species that we can look at. And what's really interesting at the moment is if you look across all these species, there are things that you can find that change across species. So changes in mitochondria, even in plants, 
and changes in neuropeptide Y signaling, even in plants. So that seems to me very strange that you have these things that change identically across all these different animals, particularly if you think animal and plant have similar changes. All right, so why do I work with worms? And here's a little video kind of showing the worm, and obviously that's not to scale. That's like a massive, I've been irradiated Godzilla worm. Um, that's actually about you know, half a millimeter in that particular video frame, so they're quite small. And because they're quite small, they're microscopic, means you can work on lots of them easily. Unlike people, you can do studies with thousands or millions fairly quickly, um, so that kind of speeds the, the rate of discovery. And they also eat bacteria, so they're cheap to actually do experiments with. Don't tell anybody that, because they'll take my money away. Um, so what else is true about them? As you saw through that video, they've got multiple organ systems, so they actually have muscles. That's what allows them to move. The development is actually sensitive to environmental conditions, so there's a little diagram that you probably can't read there that's got some arrows that show basically there are different routes that things can take, and those changes occur in response to the environment. The life history is therefore also sensitive to environmental conditions, so it means the physiology and the development will change based upon the environment. And from a kind of evolutionary perspective, you can find other nematodes, so not this specific worm, pretty much anywhere on the earth. Um, so it's the highest animal in terms of evolutionary terms that you can find on all the continents. You can find them at the bottom of the ocean. You can file and find them in deep soil. You can find them at high altitude in the mountains. And creepy, you can thaw them out after up to 40 to 50,000 years of being frozen, and they come back to life. Yeah, super weird. Um, but the other thing that I find fascinating is that you can actually accumulate reproducible mutations in response to environmental conditions very quickly. So with one of the mutants that I've worked on, we pick up spontaneous mutants or things that make the animals healthy basically every three to six months. So it's really quite interesting that you can start to study evolution in the lab in a reasonable period of time, not just studying, say, bacteria, but also a multicellular animal. All right, in terms of worms being a model for human muscle, they're worms. They do not have an interior skeleton. They do not have tendons. They do not have satellite cells. They do not have an inflammatory system. There's lots of things that they do not have. But much like people, where our muscles allow us to move around and do work, the worm has muscles that allow it to move around and do work. And from a basic science perspective, it's particularly interesting to me that st people studying gene expression in worms really discovered how do muscles become muscles? So how do we actually have these things called transcription factors that make a muscle a muscle? And even crazier than that, one of the people studying this, trying to figure out why genes are expressed in muscle and how those genes get controlled to be expressed in muscle, in the process of trying to express things in muscle, they turn gene expression off. So this is actually what led to the discovery of RNA interference. Um, and it was completely serendipitous experiment where effectively they were trying to inject DNA and their DNA synthesis facility was not purifying RNA away from it. And so after a series of experiments, they actually managed to discover this. One of the other things that people have done is they basically worked out which genes and what's the order in which the muscles go together, so particularly the contractile apparatus, which is called sarcomeres. And literally thousands of genes have been studied in the worm to actually understand what the role of those genes in regulating muscle health is. From a health perspective, it's also super creepy to me that worms have a gene called dystrophin, which is the same gene that's present in people that when mutated gives you muscular dystrophy. And unsurprisingly, when you mutate that gene in worms, they also get muscular dystrophy. And that to me is super creepy. I mean, okay, muscle structure may be conserved, but why do you get things like sensitivity to anesthesia being conserved? Who knew that you could put worms to sleep with anesthesia? Why do you get worms that basically can't exercise when they've got muscular dystrophy? Again, who knew that worms could exercise? I mean, that's just crazy. 
All right, so in terms of worms, they're a well-defined genetic model system with basic physiologic systems, simplest lab animal for studying neuromuscular function in vivo. That's why I work on it. And then it's kind of creepy to me that you can actually study things in worms and extend them to humans. So the example that most people throw out there is control of longevity by genetics. So in worms, we found that mutations in the insulin signaling pathway, so that's the same pathway that when you have problems and it gives you diabetes, promote longevity in worms, promote longevity in rodents, and creepy, people who live to be more than 100 have mutations in this pathway without having diabetes. It's the same as in people. You just live longer than you're supposed to. So worms, again, with the, with, the, with the life history being sensitive to environmental conditions, if you grow them at a low temperature, because they're poikotherms, they can't, they're cold-blooded, they can't regulate their metabolism the same way that we do. If you grow them at low temperature, they live longer. They can, under standard laboratory conditions, maybe depending on the lab, live for about 35 days. And then if you put them at high temperature, again, depending on the lab, they may live as short as 10 days. So there's a bit of a range. And then if you do different interventions, so for example, mutations in the insulin signaling pathway will frequently double the lifespan. And then the food source that we use in space actually will potentially take that up to fourfold higher. I have a challenge for you. Sitting in the audience is Dr. John Kopchak, who actually has, am I correct, the longest lived mouse? Do you have the longest lived worm? <laughs> I don't know. I've got the diet that induces the longest lived worm. Um, but somebody else has the longest lived worm based upon genetics. I don't know who does these days. Um, I, I think the latest was something like 240 days. Yeah. Um, around how many worms do you have and do you name them? I, I personally don't have any worms. I just want to go on the record. I've, I've been to the vet. I've been dewormed. I'm safe to be around. Um, at the moment in my lab, I've got five different strains of worms, and on any given plate, there's about 250 worms. In terms of naming them, yes, you have to name them. If you don't name the worms, how do you know which is which? You know, they're worms. They all look the same. But we don't necessarily name the individual worms. Usually we name the population of worms. So we'll give worms with a particular mutation a particular name, and we'll keep them kind of as a colony. Now, that said, when we start doing the space flight work, you know, they all have to get their individual little space suits. So, you know, they get their little name badges, and so... You know, we do have a whole little selection process, just like with real astronauts. We march them around the lab and figure out who's most photogenic. All right, so let's get to worms in space in those cool little space suits. So I do not deserve credit for that particular photo. That, that image is actually uh, a photocopy of a hand-drawn piece of art by Greg Nelson, who's uh, at Loma Linda University. It's actually the one who did Worms in Space for the first time, and as the picture kind of indicates there, it was on the space shuttle. So on STS-42, he basically showed that worms can mate in space. So for those of you who don't know what that means, they can have sex successfully. They can undergo two generations in space, and much like astronauts, when you bring them back, they look normal. He did find an increased rate of mutation, so that kind of raised the question of, okay, you know, do we pick up mutations in space? Followed that up on STS-76, and this is big news at the time, it's kind of old news now. Turns out that the increased rate of mutation was because worms got exposed to radiation, and there was no combined effect of radiation with microgravity. So that was a really cool experiment where he basically took worms and he put them between sheets of film where you can actually track individual radio radioactive particles and then you can actually back extrapolate 
which worms have been irradiated versus which ones haven't been irradiated. And he put worms in different places on the space shuttle. So again, manned, sorry, crewed spacecraft. So there are gonna be areas that have more radiation shielding than others. And so he stuck some worms in places that were shielded and some that weren't to basically demonstrate some of this. And then my first experiment, STS-107, that didn't go so well, kind of highlighted some of the problems of doing experiments in space quite vividly for me, particularly from a career perspective. Doesn't do you a lot of good if you do an experiment and you get no results. Hard to publish, hard to get funded, hard to have longevity in a competitive career. So in this particular flight, you know, we sent the worms up. Unfortunately, the spacecraft broke up on return. Um, but we did actually manage to go out and recover the worms, which from an astrobiology standpoint is interesting because it shows that potentially surviving re-entry can happen for microscopic organisms. All right, in terms of getting into really, really busy stuff, so this is where you can see, you know, you get younger people, they move out of doing hand-drawn cartoons in black and white, and they stretch on to doing color. Because, you know, the most important thing for doing stuff in space is logos. So there we've got a worm in space logo. And then, of course, we've got all of these other astronaut logos and, you know, another worm in space logo down in the bottom. Because, again, that's much more important than actually learning anything. It's all about having fun, right? So on Expedition 8 and 9, we basically confirmed that worms grow normally in space. Pretty boring if you want to study anything changing in space. They have a normal ability to remove dead cells. Again, unhelpful if you're trying to find something different. Normal rates of mutation when they're shielded. Again, not helpful for being able to keep flying things in space. Some movement defects in some animals, so individual variability, much like astronauts. And strangely, altered expression of about 10% of the genes in the genome, which is either a big deal or not a big deal, depending upon how you think about big numbers and big data sets. But particularly interesting, altered expression of genes expressed in muscle and altered expression of genes associated with metabolism. Yeah? For your mitochondrial proteins, are those genes that are encoded on the mitochondrial chromosome, or are those genes specified and relocated to the mitochondria. What do you think? I've seen weird things in a lot of plants, so I don't know what happens in worms. I would oh, guess come that there's... on! Mitochondria are the same. They just have slightly different numbers of genes in different species. So how many genes are in mitochondria? Is it hundreds, thousands, handful? guessing a hun hundreds based off of the data that I've looked at, but I'm yeah, not sure. Yeah, so, in, so in, in animals, Depending on the species, it's somewhere between 10 and 16. So it's very, very few mitochondrial encoded genes are actually contributing to overall mitochondrial health. Whereas, say, in people and worms, it's two to 3,000 genes in the nucleus that actually control mitochondrial health. So when you usually hear people talking, they do fall into one of two camps where they assume that the mitochondrial encoded genes are the most important ones, or they basically start talking about mitochondrial genes like I did where they're talking about nuclear encoded mitochondrial genes. Yeah. So these so are nuclear encoded. I missed the first part of this. Are these normal worms or are these like special worms? Ugh, difficult question. So I'm supposed to tell you that they're normal worms because they're the normal worms that we use. But they are special worms because these particular worms have been grown on a particular diet, which is usually different from what most people grow their worms on. And again, creepy, if you put worms into this diet, somewhere between three and five years after you grow them on this diet, they pick up a mutation in a sensory gene in the neurons, and they do it reprodu bleh, reproducibly. So you can introduce them to the diet multiple times, and you tend to see that same exact gene that changes. So they do have a sensory deficit. I have a question from the live chat or from live streaming. They're asking about the worms that were recovered. Is that Challenger? Was that the Challenger mission? Columbia. And, or excuse me, Columbia. Columbia. Um, so Challenger blew up. Uh, what? Going Challenger up broke up 
when it was going up, Columbia broke up when it was re-entering. They just wanted to question and say, really, they recovered the worms? Yes. And they were n totally fine? Define totally fine. I mean... All right, you know, a little shell-shocked, maybe, we, but we, still we, breathing. We got them back after months, so of course they had run out of food, and so they were a bit grumpy about you know, not having food, and they effectively they went into an de altered developmental state that allowed them to survive for up to six months without food. Hey, Nate, this is John over here. 10% um, of the genome up on top is um, altered, and then it's confirmed down below. Is it the same, approximately the same 10% of the genes? Yeah. And, and looking down at the bottom. Yeah, and to answer your next question, yeah, that's the same ratio of things that change under response to insulin signaling. And yes, it looks well, like Well, no, that wasn't, but that's a good question. <laughs> that's a good question. That, <laughs> but, but, but it, it looks, looks like, like they're downregulated. It looks like they're downregulated. Is that right? Yes. The, bulk so of them? The, the majority of things that we turn up are downregulated. That's correct. You said that the worms only live at a maximum about 35 days. So after a month, how did you get them back alive if they had been basically starved? <laughs> so for that particular flight, we had two different diets. We had the standard diet. And basically on the standard diet, we expect them to run out of food after about a week. And when they run out of food, they'll go into an alternate developmental state. It's called dower, which is German for enduring. So, you know, they can kind of put up with environmental conditions. And you can recover dowers up to six months after um, they dower up, and they'll actually go on to have a normal lifespan. Um, so we expected for that particular diet that we would actually recover dowers. For the other diet, the worms do live a bit longer. They can live up to four times longer. They're more stress sensitive or more frail. Um, but we anticipated for that diet because they can reach a population density of about 100,000 worms per 10 milliliters of food that given that they had been up there for only a week or so that we could probably recover live happy critters for up to six months later, which is actually what did happen. So I did oversimplify the explanation. Hey, Nate, what's the hardware you guys use? On 107, there were some plants that also came back. But yeah, so 107, of 107 was the brick 60s. Um, so, yeah, in terms of, I didn't include all the slides with the forensic reconstruction to actually explain everything. John heard me tell this story, and it's like, who knew that you could actually get the melting temperatures for different you know, materials and do forensic reconstruction. I'm like, well, the forensic guys know that. But yeah, biologists don't usually. So in terms of the overall kind of situation, payload was actually within the crew compartment. The crew compartment's actually designed to withstand breakup and kind of make things more survivable. So thing broke up at, I don't know, Mach 14. Things basically exited the cabin somewhere around Mach 1 or below. So significant change in the lethal forces. Because it's in a mid-deck locker, so mid-deck lockers are like on airplanes, if you think about where they keep the food in the galley, same idea. So because it's in a mid-deck locker, the mid-deck lockers basically break apart. That dissipates some of the forces. And then because inside the locker there's a locker, the locker dissipates some of the forces. And then because there's other materials like foam in there, that dissipates some of the forces. And then we get down to the thermoses. And so we can see that basically with those being anodized aluminum, um, they didn't melt, so they didn't get over about 1,000 degrees. But you can see, you know, burn marks on them, so you know they got over about 800 degrees. And then as you go inside and you look at the different material properties, you can tell how, how superheated things got. Do you dress up the worms in anything other than spacesuits? I don't actually dress up the worms in spacesuits. I tell everybody that, waiting to see if anybody's interested. And then when we go down that line, I tell them, you know, we've got a knitting circle. We actually knit, you know, spacesuits for the worms. And occasionally I get people coming in the lab and they start knitting. And then I explain to them that it's all a joke and they get really mad at me. So no, we don't usually dress up the worms in anything. 
Do they freeze in space? Because it seems to be really cold in space from what I've learned. Well, if you stuck them in space, they'd freeze. Yeah, generally, you know, just like people, you need to actually provide thermal control so that they don't do things like freeze. All right, so John took us on to the next expedition. So we basically have shown that things have reproducible changes in gene expression. And in between there, we also did some automated culturing for six months on the station, so long enough for a small kind of mission to Mars. I'll show you a little bit of that hardware. All right, that's enough science. You guys are going to exhaust me with questions. Again, let's go back to the cool stuff. Got to have a good logo. So again, one of the things that I love about the kind of space stuff is it does give you a good opportunity to interact with the public. It gives you a good chance to actually encourage kids to go into science, engineering, these sorts of things. So this particular logo is generated by a postdoc named Beta. She's got her own little Beta science art company. Um, and she basically does illustrations of art. And so one of the things that she does, or she had done as a fellow of um, the American Academy for the advancement of science, there we go, that's a mouthful, triple AS, um, was actually trying to encourage girls to go into science and try and take the idea of you can use your artistic tendencies and you can express science through art. Um, so she's the one who's done this logo, she's done the more recent one for us, and then of course, you know, you get dinosaurs like me who have to figure out how things like Twitter work, I mean, big enough for me to have to figure out how to do a website of all things. All right, so logo. So MME2 is an example of doing an experiment. One of the real problems with doing experiments in space is, no, you don't go to space to run your own experiment most of the time. So it's going to be done remotely. You're going to basically also largely use non-standard laboratory equipment. That's changed dramatically over the past two years, particularly with the nationalization of part of the space station for the Americans. Limited power, limited size, limited weight. So basically, you can do any experiment you want, as long as you don't require power, as long as it doesn't take up any space, and as long as it doesn't weigh anything. So everything is possible under those constraints. All right, so my personal favorite that comes up every single time, so Question about hardware, you have to make a decision about how you're gonna house things and there are all these crazy rules for safety. <sighs> Can't have astronauts eating worms, why not? I mean, they're just a bit salty. Um, so, you know, you have to put them inside containers and so for this particular experiment, we had a choice of type one cassettes, so these are European Space Agency, they have very clever names. Type one cassettes, and type two cassettes. And you can tell them apart because they look different. But um, in one case, we've got Vented. And for those of you with really good eyesight, you'll see the Mercedes-Benz logo on that particular thing. For whatever reason, Mercedes-Benz decided they wanted to get into actually doing German manufacturing spaceflight hardware. So that one's got a vent. It's got Gore-Tex membranes, so that actually allows gas exchange, so oxygen to go in and out. And on the other one, you've got an unvented cassette. And in terms of the size of these things, for those of you who know about cigarettes, they're about the size of a cigarette pack. For those of you who don't know about cigarettes, they're about the size of those old flip phones that are coming back into style. And so for these, you can think about putting anything you want inside the cassette. So the one that it's labeled as being vented, do not allow fixation. You could say put bags of worms in there, bags of cells in there. And then the one that's labeled as allowing fixation, you can put inserts in. So that particular insert is an aquarium for fish that also allows for um, fixation. So one of the things that you need to do when you decide you're going to do an experiment using something that's not actually laboratory hardware is figure out whether your experiment works. So generally speaking, in toxicology, we refer to this as toxicity testing. In materials, we often think about this as, as biocompatibility testing. So if we look over where it says initial, there we've put 500 worms into a particular piece of hardware. And if we look over at the other side where it says reference, that's how many worms we get about a week later. So we go from having 500 to way too many to count. Now, if we stick them in the hardware, if we stick them in the unvented hardware, they grow, but they don't grow particularly well. And if we grow them in the vented hardware, 
they grow a bit better. So the key difference with the venting is that they actually have oxygen going in and out. And again, I don't know why this comes as any surprise, but all the time you deal with engineers, they're like, why do you need to have access to air? I'm like, well, you know, living things kind of breathe. You know, it doesn't matter if you're a plant, doesn't matter if, you know, you're a worm, doesn't matter if you're a rodent, doesn't matter if you're an astronaut. You kind of need oxygen in order to stay alive. And so one of the most common reasons that spaceflight experiments, particularly for students, fail is that someone's very kind and they give them some hardware and they give them the opportunity to do stuff, but the hardware won't actually keep things alive. Um, so it's this kind of recurrent thing that you try and educate people about, but it becomes quite difficult. All right, so hardware issues aside, let's talk about exciting stuff. So one of the great things about spaceflight, particularly if you're doing work outside of the US, is it's an international business. You get to go to cool places, and somebody pays for it. So for this particular one, our hardware developer is in Livorno, Italy. That's a nice coastal town, used to be a, a good resort town. Um, and you can't really get there except on a cruise ship, so you have to, of horrors, you have to fly in through Pisa, you know, and why would you not stop off and actually see the sights while you're in Pisa? So we had to go to Pisa and we actually went and we saw the hardware, we agreed on how we're actually going to do the experiment. And then we got to do the really boring part. We got to go back to our labs. So at the time, I was in England for this one. So, you know, looks like a building, not particularly exciting, no leaning tower. But, you know, middle of England, it's still nice. Um, and, you know, teeny little lab. But boy, if you ask her, she'll tell you she never wants to grow worms in plastic bags again. We spent one year putting different numbers of worms in different amounts of food and different volumes into different bags so that we could actually work out the timings for when things should happen in space. After all that testing, we basically got to move on and do a science verification test. So this is basically showing that we can make the experiment work on the ground. And so there you can see our hardware with little eye buttons, which will actually record temperature coming out of the freezer. Having actually shown that we can do the experiment on the ground, we then moved on to showing that we can do the experiment on the ground in the actual space flight hardware, for example, in the incubator that we're going to use in space. So known as the experiment sequence test in Europe, I think they're still called experiment verification tests here in the US. And again, beautiful thing about space flight, Lots of acronyms, nobody ever explains to you what they mean, and not everybody uses the same ones. But again, this is what tells me I'm doing things wrong. These guys are located on a lake in Switzerland. Why am I not located on a lake? I got a river over here that potentially floods, which isn't so good. Um, but yeah, great place to go. Um, problem with it being a vacation-y type place, Super expensive to go there, so nice that somebody's paying for us to be there. So that went well. We actually got it in there, and you know, it looks super high tech. They've got lots of computer monitors. That's what makes you actually look like you're a control station, right? You know, if you actually think about it, I can control the space station from my little monitor right here, but it doesn't, or you know, nowadays with a smartphone, but it doesn't look as exciting as having lots of screens and maybe a big projector like we've gotten here. So having done that, we got to go and do even more science testing. So we got to go back and go, oh, well, what happens if there's a 24-hour delay if the rocket launches? Oh, well, what happens if there's a 48-hour delay if the rocket launches? Oh, well, what happens if there's a 72-hour delay? So more growing worms in plastic bags. So we figured all that out and worked it all out. And again, at the time that we did this, it was not particularly helpful because we were flying with SpaceX, who's Great, bringing flight back to America, but every single mission, they had a different mission profile. So we had no idea how long is it gonna take for the spacecraft to get up there? What kind of launch delays are we looking at? Um, so it made it a bit difficult. So finally getting that done, get to go down to Kennedy Space Center. For this particular one, we processed our samples in the space station processing facility, which now largely looks like a ghost town since most of the space station has been built. But much like any big industrial building, it looks like a big industrial building. And 
Despite how many times I tell people going down there, watch out for gators, everybody always thinks that I'm joking when I say, you know, there are gators in that water right there. When you come out of the building, make sure you don't get bitten. Um, but, you know, things that you don't necessarily think about. Again, with going down to Kennedy, it's great. Ooh, rockets. But not so great because it's not actually a biology lab. There's nobody doing biology there. So you get an empty lab. You have to get it set up and you actually have to get things working. Once you get that done, you can prepare your samples. And so here we've got us loading some worms into some bags and putting them in the space flight hardware. And then there's the part where you lose complete control over your experiment because you give it to somebody. And so this guy here is now putting our experiment into a container. And then somebody else wearing a bunny suit is handing it to somebody else wearing a bunny suit. And they put it somewhere on the rocket hopefully properly in the right place and not in the wrong place. And then the rocket rolls out to the pad and you've got nothing better to do than sit around and hope that the rocket goes up. If you want to, you can go out and you can watch the rocket go up and from this picture you can tell who's flown things before and who's actually got their first experiment. You've got the people going, ah! Rocket's gone up, yay, no real expression. They're just happy because they don't have to go back and do more experiments. And then you've got Amelia and Siva first launch going, whoa, there's a lot of firepower that comes out of the back end of that rocket. Cool. Eventually it docks with the space station and hopefully then somebody remembers to take your experiment off of this capsule and then hopefully they actually put it in the incubator. And then hopefully they turn the incubator on. And then when the experiment's done, hopefully they take your samples out and they put them in the minus 80 freezer. And minus 80 freezers are good for what? What particularly? Ice cream. You guys should all know that. We were giving out ice cream at the beginning. So yeah, that's... Astronauts love anything that involves freezing because what can you do when you're sending up an empty freezer? You can pack it full of ice cream, particularly from some astronauts' favorite dairy. Um, and so then hopefully somebody remembers to take your samples out of the freezer, and then hopefully after they take them out of the freezer, they remember to put them back on the rocket that's coming back, and then that comes back, the spacecraft, and then it crashes into the ocean, and you hope it doesn't sink before they get your stuff off of it. And then hopefully it comes back to the dock and somebody gets your samples. And if you don't feel like driving out to the docks, because I mean, the docks are a bit rough, you know, there's a reason people don't like being around industrial places. You can have somebody else do it and then take a picture, put it on dry ice and ship it to you. All right, so that's how we actually do something. I'll get back and talk a bit more about sciencey stuff unless anybody has any operational questions. I think there's 10 more minutes and I just want to caution you to leave some time for questions. Sure. So at the beginning you mentioned uh, on your slide that plants were harder to store than C. elegans. So what makes C. elegans easier to store? throughout this process of getting them back down? I just said that. <laughs> um, I, I think some of it's just a question of what your, what your flexibility is. I think for me, um, with focusing on not necessarily getting live things back, the way that we culture them, it's fairly easy to freeze them, and so then we're just dependent on the freezer actually working. Um, so it's similar for cell culture. For plants, it really, it, just like for worms, it depends on what your endpoints are. All right, so back to muscle, back to astronauts and worm. All right, so how do we go from being a uh, vitamin D deprived science researcher who never gets out of the lab to being an anabolic steroid injecting, nicely toned governor of California? Well. There's a bunch of things that actually regulate this. There's various catabolic and anabolic signals, and it's well documented over time. But NASA's approach to this is actually trying to use a platform called Gene Lab. It's an open science platform to try and look at what gene expression changes in space and across species. 
So if we look at things that actually alter in space on muscle health, I told you before there's kind of two categories. One is cytoskeletal and one's mitochondrial. I'm just going to focus on the cytoskeletal for this talk. In this particular case, there's a bunch of proteins that actually allow the attachment of the inside of the muscle to the outside of the muscle. And so on Earth, normally we've got sarcomeres that make these nice straight lines which contract like this to allow us to contract our muscles. If we disrupt the genes in those complexes, they kind of crinkle up into little balls. So unsurprisingly, when that happens, if we measure the strength of worms, and don't ask how we do that, that's on the next slide, um, they go from this nice black distribution, which is kind of broad, to a very narrow distribution of being much weaker. And we can actually also measure their metabolism, so mitochondrial respiration. So in black lines are normal worms, and then in white lines, which are much lower down, are what happens when we actually disrupt the attachment complex. So these things on Earth seem to influence muscle health, which begs the question, are worms in space weaker? Yes, they are, actually. And that creeps me out, because they're actually about as weak in space as astronauts often are. And again, super creepy. There's a correlation between the extent of gene expression change in the cytoskeleton quantitatively with the actual extent of change in quantitative reduction in space. So how do we measure worm strength in space? Well, just like with people where you might actually have them lift things or push things, we get the worms to push against something and then we use fancy math or physics and we actually just apply a calculation for the pillar deflection to actually calculate how much force was used to actually do that. So that you can use simple things like Hooke's laws for springs, which has been around for a long time, or you can use really fancy beam th theory, which you know, improves your quantification just a small, small amount. Um, how do you make those pillars if the worms are so tiny? It's a mold. And so basically what you do is you have a device, sometimes it's 3D printed, sometimes not, and you basically have teeny tiny holes and then you pour material, in this case PDMS, which is a polymer, and it fills those holes and then you basically take it out of the mold. So it's just like having a jello mold, except a little bit fancier. I'm curious. I remember taking my son through his driver's ed test, you know, with the pylons where you had to go in and out. Took forever. How did you teach the worm how to do that? Doesn't it just want to go down straight down the line? Yes. So we cherry pick the data for the worms that are actually behaving nicely for our analytical purposes. We kind of ignore the worms that go through the pillars and under the pillars. And really strange thing in space, they actually wrap around the pillars, and we don't really understand exactly why they do that because that seems to be specific to space flight. All right, so if we take these same things and now we go away from worms and we start to think about people, do people have these same attachment complexes? Yes, they do. Now, people, we maybe image the muscles a bit differently. So if we disrupt the complexes in people, we see things look a little bit different. But if we actually look at muscle strength when we disrupt the complexes in people, it drops in both younger and older people. And again, if we look at mitochondrial respiration, they go from those nice black bars to those little white bars. So it looks like the kind of process by which these attachment complexes maintain muscle health is probably similar in young and old. And we actually think that this is a maintenance system for muscle in people. All right, really, really complicated slide. I don't expect you to take too much away from this other than the title. So if we think about being able to do things like measure strength or mitochondrial respiration, and we talked about all these measuring gene expression changes in people, sorry, in worms, can we measure gene expression changes in people? The answer to that is yes. So in this particular study with the red and blue and pink and gold colors, we looked at gene changes with immobilization for four days, so cast immobilization. And what we see, much like the space flight data, is we see changes in mitochondrial gene expression, and those actually correlate with the extent of muscle loss. We also see changes in things that regulate protein synthesis, and those correlate with changes in muscle protein synthesis. So last two points I want to make. Really complicated slide right there, which is basically comparing what happens to gene expression changes in response to exercise, and what happens to gene expression changes with 
lack of use or disuse. Because normally what you would think is exercise is the exact opposite of not walking around, right? Well, it turns out that's not actually the case. So if you can actually read those boxes, you'll notice that the things that go up with exercise are not the same things that go down with disuse. And so if you can't read those boxes, what you can see is that there's not you know, direct overlap of those Venn diagrams, which is supposed to show you where your overlap for gene expression is. So they're actually distinct biological processes. And why does this matter? So inactivity has been decided to be one of the top five leading causes of death in the world by the World Health Organization. Who funds research on inactivity? Yeah, not too many people. Lots of people studying, you know, activity. Lots of people saying you need to get more activity, but nobody actually really trying to understand what goes wrong with inactivity other than really the space agencies. So when people talk about areas for spinning things out, this potentially becomes an area for that. Now in terms of spinning things in, here on Earth, we know that we can actually get people's genomes. We know that we can look at gene expression changes. We know that we can get particular molecular signatures for cancer. So why not do this with astronauts? Why not actually get their genetic data? Why not actually see, well, you know, we know that there are problems with the eyes and it looks like the pathophysiologic basis for that happens to be similar to this optic degeneration problem. You actually have a mutation in that gene maybe you're at increased risk for having ocular problems. Or similarly, could we look at which genes are changing in space and say, oh, well, you know, it looks like actually you're having changes in these physiologic systems or those physiologic systems. So it seems like this is an open area for the space agencies to embrace, which is a bit difficult because historically, particularly driven by the U.S., astronauts are special and their privacy needs to be protected. And the argument that I always make is, how are they more special than everybody else? Everybody's special. You know, if we can study Olympic athletes, why can't we study astronauts? Um, but I get it, you know, the regulatory environment's different in different countries, and it's particularly different with Europe, which is where we've been focused at the moment. And with that, I'll take questions. Although you've asked enough questions already. <laughs> and hard ones, too. Questions? Um, what organisms would you use to study like cardiac or smooth muscle? Because this is for skeletal, you said. Um, it really depends what you're trying to study. Um, so I think in the U.S. there'd be a strong bias towards any cardiovascular probably needs to be done in rodents. Uh, there are some similarities with changes in astronauts and rodents. Again, in the U.S., there's a bit of a disagreement between how good a model mice are versus rats um, for various things. From a funding perspective, probably a lot easier to study it using organoids uh, because there's a lot more money for doing that. And so there are some models there. How good they are, I don't know. You could potentially do it in worms. Um, People don't actually like to acknowledge that the electrophysiology of the worm pharynx is similar to uh, what it is in, um, in people. Similarly, if you want to study cardiac, you can do that in Drosophila. Again, there are some arguments to be made about whether the electrophysiology is similar or not. But certainly if it's vascular, you have to have a vascular system. But you could study vascular in plants, just a different vascular system. Hey, Nate, I was impressed when you said in the permafrost, there was a, you could, after 40,000 years. That's creepy, isn't it? Are they in a dour state that long? No, they, so the worms are kind of weird. So I, if you think about the kind of natural history of kind of things that live in the soil, if you think about the idea that there's a freeze-thaw cycle with, with the year, it's probably the case that worms have kind of evolved to have an ability to freeze over winter. So with the worm that I work with, the first larval stage is actually particularly freeze hardy. And one of the things that they do more so in the L1 phase or the first larval phase is they have high levels of trohylose. So it's a different um, carbohydrate. 
and has a lot of kind of more um, antifreeze type properties. But that's also one of the theories for, because the trihylose metabolism is altered in the long-lived mutants, that's also one of the theories on how that's actually promoting longevity is you basically have a, a chaperone function of carbohydrate. Well, at this point, I encourage anybody who still has questions to come on down and talk to him. Uh, but at this time, why don't we just say thank you.